Hello, my name is Wyatt, and this is going to be my review of the book Superabundance. Uh, in this review, I'll be going over my general impressions, my simple analysis of some of the claims that are made in this book, and an application of how, this, how the conclusions and ideas in this book might apply to the field of international development. So let's get right in with a general overview of what this book goes through and the general ideas and claims that the authors are making. So the book Superabundance by Marion L. Tupi and Gail L. Pooley is a collection of research and conclusions that go through the general topics of population growth, how we manage our resources, and generally how we as a civilization, as people, view the purpose of humanity, in essence, which is sounds pretty broad, and in a way it is. The first few sections of this book go through a wide range of different ideas, different, um, <clears throat> almost an overview of history, uh, at least through the lens of what the authors are trying to establish. Because in essence, this book wades into a whole field of research that has already been established. And for countless centuries, as a matter of fact, there's been this ongoing debate over the question of, is population growth a positive result for humanity? What are the effects of that? How should we react to the growth of modern civilization? Because I, the, the, the main focus of this book is essentially a rebuttal to the claims originally made by Reverend uh, Malthus, who basically established the Malthusian view of, of population growth, which uh, Reverend Malthus uh, was a, essentially a, largely a mathematician, from what I understood from the book, who studied the ideas of exponential growth, which as he saw it, as, uh, as coming out of the Enlightenment period, civilization was rapidly beginning to develop. He saw that at current trends, at the rates that he was viewing at the time, it, it was completely un unsustainable. That eventually, inevitably, if populations continue to develop and grow, they will grow until all resources are consumed that are available. Because that is, that is a trend that we do see a lot in nature. Uh, nat uh, wild native populations will develop and grow as abundantly as there are resources and once that uh, carrying capacity once the all the resources in the area are consumed there's a population collapse that only slowly recovers as the resources regenerate in their area and that, that is a phenomenon in nature that's why I, as I think the authors alluded to uh, biologists do tend to agree on this theory and believe that this is a valid a valid understanding a valid application when it is applied to humanity because well, I mean we are a part of nature we are a part of this world so why wouldn't this apply and that's kind of what the authors get into essentially they begin to note some exceptions some problems with the theory with the Malthusian view of the world essentially their point that I got from this book I, I obviously I'll get into my analysis here in a moment but essentially the the theory that the issues that they bring up has to do with how according to the Malthusian view there's a supply and demand curve and as population grows that means demand rises rapidly which outstrips any amount of supply and the more it basically says that population growth is inversely related to the supply of natural resources which means that growing population inevitably will reduce the quality of life and availability of resources for the population as a whole that is at least the theory and yet the authors do make a point that although we've witnessed an immense amount of growth of population over the last century and a half two centuries we haven't exactly seen this model hold up in any meaningful way because 
currently today population like living standards across the board barring some few exceptions continue to rise even in developing countries we are seeing a slow increasing trend of living standards despite the fact that the world's population is the biggest that it's ever been and resource consumption is at the highest levels has ever been in history so what exactly is going on here why is this model this theory this view of the world not exactly working as as biologists and as economists and as other researchers might believe it should be um and that's kind of what the authors go through they make a they go through a variety of claims that have to do with uh, the way that innovation works, the way that resource scarcity functions. They make some very bold claims, which is why this is, as I, as I was reading, a very controversial book. Um, they make claims in regards to how population controls are a, a, a very a, an unethical thing and a hindrance to human development, civilizational development. Um, but... At, at its core, this book is essentially putting forward the claim that increased population is not directly tied to like it, it, okay. Let me see, let me try and like put this into like comprehensible terms. Um, as I understand it, the authors are essentially claiming that increased population is a net benefit to humankind and the planet rather than a detriment while Malthusianism well while the Malthusian view of the world would say that greater population is just simply more mouths to feed a bigger drain on the limited resources that we have in a finite world the authors instead make the claim that resources at least viewed from the Malthusian view is a very limited understanding of what resources are actually available to humanity and they go into certain points that, uh, I don't know, like there are certain points that I certainly don't have the qualifications to um, verify or deny. Um, some more persuasive than others. Uh, they make the point that no, the knowledge is a resource that isn't often accounted for in these models. That knowledge compounds with each and every generation moving forward particularly today given the fact that um, technology and the institutions and basically the systems that we have in place allow knowledge to very easily pass around easier than it has ever been in the history of the world um, and given that knowledge is a resource that essentially allows civilization to develop they note that over the past two centuries almost every 10 years ever like consistently there are new innovations that change our relationship to the resources that we consume and of course like as some might note industrialization rapidly increases energy use and resource consumption to varying effects it's often environmental detriment yet the authors here note that since industrialization civilization has found ways to replace become more efficient um, use less resources for higher gains agriculturally developed to avoid the famines that were often predicted um, throughout the 60s and 70s there seems to be a long series of innovations that disrupt the, the frequent predictions that are somewhat apocalyptic so that's that's just a brief overview of some of what the claims are in this book that's kind of the main impressions that i got from this and so let's just move into my very simple analysis of what i took away from uh, the claims made in this book so the claims that um Tupi and puli make here are quite bold and I think that's kind of an inherent feature of why this book was written this book goes against a lot of the conventional approach that researchers and economists and, and a lot of academia in general takes when they approach environmental issues and political issues and policy making and because 
this book is going against the grain in such a significant way. It's almost given that um, publications like this, um, if they are meant to oppose established ideas, often go almost to the extreme in the other direction to try and, um, given the fact that they're going so far beyond what is conventionally accepted, and for better or for worse. And given the fact that they are making some outlandish claims, there are significant sections of the book that I found to be less persuasive. For instance, their, their interpretation of resources on the planet, they make some interesting claims, absolutely. Like, given their, like, their unique interpretation of how we've come up with new ways to use resources and become more efficient, at least in certain parts of the world, I thought it was very interesting, but the idea that they they claim that there actually is not a finite amount of resources on the planet was quite bold, and I think that it goes a little bit beyond. <laughs> it, it, I think that is an overcorrection in the other direction from the finite resource claim. Uh, there, my understanding is that although there is a great abundance of available resources that we can very creatively use there seems to be still like there's always going to be an inherent investment in energy and a, and a byproduct cost of using natural resources i mean that's what um that's what a lot of our international development class has studied how the way that we use resources is not even just about the scarcity or limited availability of resources it is often the simple byproducts of what we do, human activity, that then has an impact on the environment, which is itself a resource, a collective um, community resource. So a lot of their claims about, their very optimistic claims about uh, humanity's relationship to the earth and its resources, I think was a bit excessive, a bit I would take an incredible uh, more evidence than I saw in the book to really persuade me to at least consider it. But I think that the book had other very interesting valid arguments and things that it touched on. Uh, one thing that I took away that was touched on in um, the internet our international development class was given was about population controls. Um, even in other literature, like the poor economics book that we often review, class. Uh, poor economics also took a very somewhat uh, skeptical view of population controls. They've been attempted numerous times, often in, as a reaction to this idea that population growth is a negative, that it is unsustainable. Um, in India, in China, in certain uh, a variety of regions of the world that had rapid population rises, population controls were enacted, but either they were not effective in achieving their goal or there were so many inherent ethical issues or problems like harms detriments in their in their implementation that it was just not worth it even from the policy the policymakers view even if you do think that um, population controls have natural benefits even then the costs of how they were implemented particularly in china as both as this book, um, Superabundance, notes, the horrific uh, violations of basic human rights and ethics was so drastic that there really is not that great of a defense for the one-child and two-child policies that were implemented um, in communist China. And in India as well, even the much more scaled-back, relatively tame population control measures by comparison to China even then, the authors of Superabundance note that there were ethical violations and uh, poor economics. That book kind of just lays out how relatively ineffective that those measures were. So I did find that to be a, a nice consistency between this book and some more established literature, which I think gave that claim and a few others in the book a little bit more credence, which was uh, refreshing. Um, but I think just as my 
general analysis, I think one of the most interesting things, the most useful things that this book provides is a new way to uh, understand and analyze resource availability and the value of resources in different areas in different countries and their availability. Uh, the authors implement what they call uh, time prices, uh, which instead of just taking currencies and trying to do um, uh, price parity analysis um, to try and understand just for uh, differences in economics and availability and uh, income standards of living those those analyses require an immense amount of information to uh, to be usefully accurate but what the authors did was they would take um, as I understood it uh, the incomes of different demographics and analyze the amount of time that it would take to garner enough income to be able to purchase access a certain amount of resources and that simple conversion at least as far as they used it was very interestingly helpful particularly if you applied it as a comparison tool between different time periods to try and understand like how resource certain resources have become more abundant at least in our modern day and age so i thought that tool was very helpful um, but at, with that analysis out of the way and my limited analysis, I would note that I really am not an expert in this field. I'm not that well versed in the literature of these theories of international economics, um, policy making, generally this the statistics and data that go into this. But at least as far as my uh, education and understanding goes. That is my analysis of some of what the authors claim here. Although I certainly don't have um, enough evidence to uh, necessarily confirm or deny completely what the authors uh, are claiming here. So just as a, a summary as, uh, as we move into this last section, how does this book's idea, ideas apply to the field of international development? I would argue that a lot of what this book seeks to investigate out, out of all of what this book seeks to claim only part of it is really practically applicable to the field of international development a lot of the developments that the authors celebrate with good cause are largely centered in first world countries in America, the EU, uh, particularly in the gains of efficiency. The, the amount of land use that America uses for farming, for uh, different fields, manufacturing, uh, energy use, America has enjoyed a surprising, surprising gains, not only in productivity, but in efficiency, using less materials for increased production. Uh, less energy for uh, a, uh, like a reduction in energy use despite the fact that our economy continues to grow the reality is that a lot of that centers on the fact that the u.s enjoys rapid innovation and an a vast abundance of capital which is a major distinction between the united states and other for uh, other first world countries and developing countries that don't have access to the same capital that allows developing countries to take advantage of a lot of the innovations that first world countries enjoy the farming equipment and um, advanced irrigation methods the ability to essentially um, implement mass agriculture those kinds of as just one example those kinds of uh, innovations require inherently a great deal of capital to implement. So I think that while developed countries that have industrialized, the, the author's claims may possibly be valid, it seems like developing countries would first have to industrialize before they could see the benefits and possibly some of this abundance that is the author's claim. And in the meantime, there are issues with the fact that while 
these countries are developing they do continue to use more resources and they don't have the flexibility to tap into different markets different methods of production different ways to use their capital to avoid running into these issues of over using regional resources until they're depleted um, a recent presentation on salmon fishing for instance noted the fact that in certain african regions that were farming the the feed used to farm salmon that those um those fishing industries in africa had no choice but to overfish because they lack the capital to support any other industry so i think there's issues here i think the author's claims might be very optimistic to the point of being almost overly optimistic but they don't exactly apply universally which is oftentimes the problem with ideologies or theories if they're applied across a broad spectrum of uh, a broad population like the entirety of Earth. So, but what I think that they're, as I previously noted, it might be helpful for policymakers to appreciate that population growth might not be such an inherent evil or detriment to developing countries as some would be led to believe there might and given that from the environmental perspective from many other industries many other fields of work and research many might say that population growth is an inherent evil that it is going to dramatically harm humanity and the environment and many other things but which i i don't have the authority to speak to but it is helpful to see the full gambit of how population growth might have some inherent benefits to developing countries, at least as a consideration. And with that consideration, of course, we would have to use this method that the authors introduce of time prices in other, in other research to see if time prices are actually a valid, helpful research tool. Hopefully other, um, other scholars, other researchers can implement these tools uh, to test them out see if they are actually a helpful um, a helpful tool for modern research or if perhaps there's inherent flaws in how it was applied by the authors in which case that would be a very valid way to um, to refute a lot of the claims made here perhaps that is the case perhaps they have over greatly overestimated the way that abundance works and how resource availability works in the modern world but that is my general summary for the book superabundance it was a very interesting read and i think that it should be read with skepticism and a healthy awareness of the other literature in the industry but read with the understanding that perhaps there are very helpful criticisms that ground a lot of what common conventional thinking has to say when there is a wide consensus across a, a field as broad as this it can be very necessary to have some means of continuously testing challenging or investigating possible flaws particularly when such theories and broad consensus seem to deviate or run into challenges when it comes to failing predictions that we see today. So, I don't know. That is my understanding of the book Superabundance. Hopefully this has been a helpful overview of uh, the book from at least a layman's perspective or a simple college student's understanding of this new entry into the broad field of literature that is population studies and resource studies. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this. I hope this has been helpful. I hope this has been at least moderately insightful and cohesive. And um, I invite everybody who's listening to this to go and research this for themselves. At least begin to investigate so this subject. It's certainly something that's going to become more and more prevalent as the years go by. And as we begin to consider a variety of environmental issues and... Um, the uh, many challenges that are facing the world today so that's my invitation to everybody and hopefully uh, 
hopefully as we move forward, more research can be conducted on this kind of stuff and that uh, we can verify and come to a better understanding of how the world around us works. So that's my uh, summary conclusion. Thank you for the t taking the time to listen to this, and I wish you all the, uh, the best of luck moving forward. I wish you all well. Take care.